church. We're going to continue our series as we're getting close to the end uh, of our series in the Gospel of Mark. So if you have a Bible, turn to Mark chapter 14. If you need uh, a Bible, there should be one in the chair right in front of you. Just reach underneath there. Uh, you should find a Bible there, Mark chapter 14, as we begin today. Uh, there's a great quote uh, that, that I think is really uh, true, and it's really helpful, uh, and it will help us as we kind of begin to frame up where we're going to be uh, focusing today. Uh, it's by the ever-wise, uh, ever-popular uh, Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous, right? Seems like a lot of great wisdom is out there by this person, but we don't know who these people are, right? But they say this, that character, talking about character, character is revealed when pressure is applied, the character is revealed when pressure is applied. So it's really this idea that if you want to know who a person is, because that's what character is. Character is who a person is really. It's a measure of who a person is really. And character is best revealed, is really best seen when pressure comes, right? So if you want to get to know somebody and get to know who they really are, you want to know, you know, what they care about, what they value, you want to know about just kind of, you know, their, their demeanor, their, their, their personality. If you really want to get to know a person, turn up the pressure a little bit and the real person is going to come out, Right? Uh, we see that in so many different ways throughout, throughout life. Um, you may get caught in the traffic jam on 45 yesterday, kind of going north, right? It's, you're lucky to be back is what I heard, right? Like, I heard it was insane. Now, I'm going to assume, because I know some of you people, and you're really, you're really great people, that you, you kept your cool the, the whole hour and a half that you were stuck on 45, right? But I, I'll be honest with you, for, for me, sometimes, man, if I'm running late, and I hate being late, and there's traffic, and all these people don't know how to drive, and they're not letting me do what I need to do. Like sometimes, if I'm honest, man, that pressure turns up and every now and then there's a little bit of, about who I am on the inside that, that kind of pokes his head out that I'm not, a big, I'm not a big fan of, right? Because when you apply pressure, that character comes out. Maybe you're facing a financial struggle or situation. You know, you, uh, you got an unexpected hospital bill or your AC goes out and you had a vacation planned or you just kind of had this week planned and, you know, you got enough to get by and all of a sudden you got this extra stress added and it's funny how when, you know, when those times come that sometimes our character creeps, creeps out a little bit and you get to see really what a person is all about. See that whenever we you know, have this kind of relationship between adversity and, and character, it's really an important thing. James Lane Allen was a, a writer back in the 1800s, early 1900s. He said it this way, that adversity does not build character, but it reveals character, Right? So when any, whenever we face adversity, we oftentimes get a glimpse, a really deeper glimpse at who a person really is, what they're really all about when, when, when everything just kind of goes crazy or goes haywire or they face that difficulty. Well, in our passage today, we, we get to see Jesus in a time of adversity, in a time of difficulty. A time that probably up until this point in the life of Jesus throughout the gospel, we have not seen him having to face uh, this level of pressure, of anxiety, uh, of stress. And, and we see in this moment that, that that adversity reveals some things to us about Jesus. And I want us to focus on that today because that picture of Jesus, how he responds to this difficulty, how he responds to adversity, and, and, and really what, what he does in these moments, I think, has some really important lessons for us because we're all going to find ourselves stuck on 45. We're all going to find ourselves facing financial difficulty. We're all going to find ourselves maybe walking through, you know, really, really difficult trying times that would make 45 look like a cakewalk. And when that happens, how can we respond in a way that both glorifies God, keeps our focus in the right place, and reflects the life of Jesus? That's what I want to talk to you about today. So if you'll stand with me, Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 32. We read 32 through 42, and if you're new this morning, if you're a guest with us, at the end of our reading, we always say the phrase, the very words, just to distinguish God's word from my own this morning. Mark 14, 32 says this, and they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to greatly and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. And I am going a little further. He fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. 
And he came and found him sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came a third time, and he said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It's enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is to betray, be betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. You have a seat. Thanks. So we see in this passage of Scripture, Jesus in a, a moment of incredible pressure, incredible, incredible stress, incredible anguish, and, and feeling the weight of, of what he was soon to experience on the cross. So to kind of put in context of where we are in the life and the story of Jesus, Jesus is simply he's hours away from being arrested and betrayed by one of his disciples. He's hours away from being falsely accused and tried by the religious leaders in his day and found guilty of blasphemy. He's he's just hours away from being beaten and tortured. He's hours away from being nailed to a cross. He's hours away from giving his life, uh, dying on the cross for the sins of the world. He's days away from the resurrection. But in this moment here in the garden, we see Jesus feeling the pressure and the weight and the adversity that was coming to him because of the cross and what lay before him. So let's look at a couple things to really understand the context and and this picture that we see of Jesus, which I think is so important for us to understand and, and, and get today. Look at verse 32, Mark 14. It says, and they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. So they just finished, he and his disciples just finished celebrating the Passover together, instituting what became known as the Lord's Supper, where he took the bread and the cup at the end of the meal, and he said, this bread now represents my body, which will be broken for you. This cup is now my blood that will be shed for you. And he, he introduced the idea of this new covenant that was coming and salvation that was going to come. And so they go, and now they go to a garden, a garden called Gethsemane. It's a, it's a, a word that means olive press. It was a place of, of crushing where they would crush the olive and they would, they would take the oil from the olives and they would sell it and they would use it. And so they find themselves in this garden. And as they enter the garden, Jesus says to, to eight of his disciples, stay here uh, while, while I go in. And, he, and it says in verse 34 that he takes Peter, James, and John. Look what it says. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. So they enter the garden. He says to the eight, listen, stay here. I'm going to go pray. And he takes takes three with him. He takes Peter, James, and John. So Jesus had his relationship with with 12 of his disciples. At this time, there's 11 because Judas, the one who would betray him soon, has already left to go and and to bring the, the mob to arrest Jesus here in just a little bit of time, in a couple hours in the context of the passage, but Jesus takes these three with whom he had an even more intimate relationship with, a deeper relationship with. They were ones that that he spent even more time with, and he takes them further along in the garden, and he says to them, hey, he says, listen, the, 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 the distress and the sorrow and the weight and the pressure that I'm feeling, he says, I'm sorrowful even to death. That he says, listen, that, that what, I, what I'm experiencing, what, I, what I'm feeling is very real, and it's so, it's so deep, and it's so sorrowful that, that, that I feel like I'm going to die. And he says to them, listen, remain here and just keep watch. Like, just, just be with me in this moment. We see a picture of Jesus here that we don't see often throughout Scripture. We see Jesus at this place of extreme vulnerability. We see Jesus at... This place of struggle, we see Jesus really in, in the fullness of his humanity. See, the, 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 the character and the person of Jesus is, is one that is fully God, but it's also fully man. And a lot of times it's real easy to see the fully God part as he heals people, as he teaches, as, as he performs miracles. And, and in this, 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 this moment here in the garden, we see the humanity of Jesus on display. We see that in this moment, as he was moving toward the cross, that, that, that Peter used, or that Mark uses words, excuse me, that, that expressed the strongest possible anguish. 
We see that Jesus was not standing and praying like, like would typically be done, but he has, he has fallen on the ground just because of the weight and his sheer desperation of that moment. We see that in this moment that Jesus is vulnerable, that he wasn't immune to, to pain, to stress, to, to pressure adversity. We see that Jesus was carrying the weight of this difficulty. He wasn't numb to what he was facing. Jay Brooks is a, a commentator and author, said this uh, about this passage. He said, Mark indicated that Jesus did not die with stoic apathy as though death had no consequence. He really hurt as he approached on the cross. See, I think this is such an important picture of Jesus because it helps us understand the fullness of who he is and who he is for us. Isaiah 53, 3, the Old Testament prophet spoke of the Messiah, the one who would come one day that we know is Jesus Christ, that Jesus fulfilled that, that he was the Messiah. It says this about that Messiah. He says this about Jesus, that he was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. This is an important picture of Jesus because it reveals to us that Jesus knows pain. Jesus knows adversity. He knows stress. He knows what it's like to grieve. He knows what it's like to be betrayed by those who you've, you've invested in and spent time with. He, he knows what it's like to be falsely accused. He knows what it's like to die a death that he, you don't deserve. He, he knows all of those things. And so what that says to me and it says to us today is that for those of us who, who follow Jesus, who have made him our Lord and Savior, that he's not immune to what we're going through. He's not unaware of the difficulty that comes in life. That when we turn to him and we look to him, he doesn't look at us and go, I don't really understand what you're going through because I'm, I'm God. He says, though I am God, I know fully what you're experiencing. And so we can turn to the Messiah, our Savior, as one who understands. He gets it. He faced, and it faced here in this, this point, extreme difficulty. And so what do we see about Jesus in this moment where he faced what I think was probably the most difficult circumstance of his earthly time up to this point? Well, we see this. If you take notes, maybe write this down. That when Jesus faced the most difficult circumstances of his time on earth, he prayed. That when Jesus faced the most difficult circumstances of his time on earth, he prayed. That when Jesus found himself overwhelmed, when Jesus found himself struggling, when Jesus found himself sorrowful, when Jesus found himself carrying the weight of everything that was to come before him, his response was to pray. His response was to pray. If I'm honest with you, I think in my life, sometimes prayer is, is not the, the go-to. Prayer is not the, the first thing I think about. Prayer is almost sometimes the afterthought of how I want to deal with the situation. Is yeah, I believe in prayer. Maybe I'll throw up a little prayer, but, but I want to try to handle whatever's going on on my own. Because why? It's what we're taught to do. But Jesus fully God, yet fully man, in his moment of extreme adversity and difficulty, the character that we see, the person of Jesus we see, is, is one who turned to prayer. And so if Jesus turned to prayer in difficulty, why do we sometimes hesitate to turn to prayer in the most difficult circumstances of our lives? What I want to do in our time today is I want to not just encourage us with here's how Jesus responded, but I want us to look at the prayer that he prayed in this moment. Because I believe what we see through the prayer of Jesus in this moment is something that could be helpful for us as we understand God, as we understand Jesus, as we understand prayer and understand how we can respond and how we should respond when we face our own difficulty in this life. I was reading an article about this, this passage I was studying this week, and the, 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 the author, a guy named John Piper, he, he called this the greatest prayer in the world. 
said it's the greatest prayer in the world. And I borrowed that, that idea for the title of this message today because I, I think when we look at this, we see what was probably the greatest prayer that could ever be prayed. And we see as an example for us today. Let's look at a couple things. If you're taking notes, write these down. What can we learn from the prayer of Jesus? Well, number one is this, is that we see that, that his prayer was relational. His prayer was relational. That Jesus in this moment, he didn't pray to some distant being. He didn't pray to some distant God. He prayed to his father. Look at Mark 14, 36. It says, and he said, Abba, Father. See, this word Abba is an Aramaic word that, that was kind of the common language in Jesus' day. And it's, it's a word that means dad or daddy. It's not a title of um, kind of position or, or, or distance. It's, it's one that really is focused more around what a little child would say to their dad in the family relationship. So of everything in that moment that Jesus could have called out to his heavenly father and called him and addressed him, he called him daddy. He called him dad. Showed that there's this intimacy, there's this closeness between Jesus and the Father. In that moment, it was about relationship. It wasn't just about what he was going to ask. You know, that same thing in that same way is how he taught his disciples to pray back in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, when they asked him to pray. Many of us recognize it today as the Lord's Prayer. He said, pray, like, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The Greek word, their father, is, is reminiscent and kind of speaks back to this Aramaic word and this concept of dad. Because, see, Jesus was saying, I'm going to call my dad, dad. I'm going to call my heavenly father, daddy, because in this moment, I have a relationship with him. Well, guess what? When he taught us to pray, he taught his disciples to pray, he said, you too can go to your father as dad. Because John 1, 12 tells us this, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. If you have been saved today, if you have put your faith and your trust in Jesus, when we pray, we don't pray to some distant clockmaker, some distant being, some really, you know, uh, hurtful God who just wants to smack us down when we do wrong. We pray to and can pray to our dad. Now, I know in saying that, the, the, the tension comes in that sometimes our concept of dad is skewed and messed up because we had an imperfect father. Now, I am an imperfect father. I get that. And, but for some of you, when you hear that word dad, it doesn't bring comfort. It brings suspicion. It brings trauma. It brings abandonment, and so you think, and you, have, you wrestle with this idea of, okay, I understand that he's, he's our father, but, but I have a hard time understanding what a good father really is. And so in those moments, though, we, we've got to push back to the imperfections of our own father. We've got to look to the idea of a perfect father, because that's who God is. Yes, he's creator and sustainer. He is holy. He is righteous. He is sovereign. He is powerful, but he is also dad. Who is slow to anger, who's abounding in love, who, who cares for us, who knows what's best for us, who, who gave everything so that we can know him through Jesus on the cross. So when we find ourselves in difficulty and even, even in times of, of good times and just every, every, everyday times, we can understand that, that Jesus knew this and we too can know that when we pray, we pray in relationship. Listen, prayer is, is ultimately not about transaction, but relationship. See, a transaction is I give you something, I get something in return. And so often we have such a shallow view of prayer because we view prayer in that way. Prayer is a time where I go to God asking for something, and he should give me what I'm asking for. And so if I say the right thing or if I, if I do the right thing, then God will give me what I'm asking for. So it's kind of like a vending machine. We put the money in, we press the button, and, and what we want comes out. The problem with that is, is that if you put the money in, you press the number, and you don't get out of the vending machine what you wanted to get out of the vending machine, you oftentimes don't want to go back to the vending machine. 
Because in our mind, a transaction is we do our part, we get back what we want. You see, God doesn't work like that. Ultimately, it's not a transaction, it's a relationship. Now, we're going to see that, yes, we ask for things. Yes, that's a part of it. But we do so in the context of the pursuit of God more than the pursuit of the things that we're asking for. Second thing we see about the prayer of Jesus is this, is that his prayer was based on truth and trust. It was based on truth and trust. Jesus prayed with an understanding of who God is. And he trusted in that. Look at verse 36 again in Mark 14. He goes on to say, all things are possible for you. So Jesus says, Abba, Father, Dad, I know that everything is possible for you. He prays to God's power. He understands that God has the ability and the power to do anything God desired to do. He understood who the Father was. He understood, like he said in Mark 10, 27, When Jesus was talking to his disciples, it said that Jesus looked at them and he said, with man it's impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Jesus had no doubt that whatever God wanted to do, God could do. He had no doubt that whatever he was going to ask his father to do, that God had the power to do that. And so his prayer was based on that truth, but it was also based on the trust that God could actually do the things he said he was going to do. Yeah, I wonder this, do we hinder our prayers sometimes or maybe even not voice prayers sometimes because we really don't know who God is? Or maybe we really don't trust in what we've been told about God. See, Jesus prayed believing in the power of God and his ability to do whatever he wanted to do, and he trusted in that so much that he was willing to come to him in this moment and go to the Father in that trust and based on that truth. Third thing we see about his prayer is this, is his prayer was open and honest. So we see that Jesus prayed to the Father in a relational way. He prayed... Uh, according to truth and in trust of that, but he was also open and honest in his prayer. Look at Mark 14, 33 through 36. It says, and going a little further, he fell down on the ground and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, remove this cup from me. Jesus told God exactly what he desired in that moment. He was open. He was honest with his father. Jesus did not want to die. He did not want to have to suffer what lay before him. He said, listen, may this hour pass for me. The hour he was talking about was was all the events of what we know was going to come now in his life. He said, would you take this cup from me? Cup is is symbolic of the judgment of God, that Jesus was going to take on the the wrath of God's perfect judgment against sin. He was going to, for the first time in all eternity, be separated from God, not in relationship, but be, be separated because he took on the sins of the world. And in facing all of that, he asked his, his heavenly father, he asked his dad, if it's possible, can we do something different? Is it possible? If it's possible, this doesn't have to happen to me. I read read that and I ask the question, was that okay? Like, was it okay for Jesus to be that bold with the Father to, to in some ways, kind of question the plan of God? Is it okay to be brutally honest with God in prayer? Well, we know this, that from this point, Jesus died on the cross, and he died as a perfect sacrifice, meaning he was without sin. So if he was without sin, then his prayer was not wrong. His prayer was okay and right. So what does that teach me? It teaches me that I can and need to be honest in my prayers to God. You know, it's funny that we wouldn't be honest because God already knows anyway, right? I was thinking about this as as a parent. Have you ever tried to entrap your kid? All right, here's what I mean. Like, have you ever known your kid did something wrong, but you just didn't walk in and let them know that you knew, but you just kind of questioned them a little bit? 
So like, you know the answer, but you ask the question like, hey, did you do that? Or, hey, what happened here? And they kind of start telling the story. So you ask a follow-up question to try to dig a little bit deeper. Because what you're wanting to know is, are they going to trust you enough to be honest with you? Right? And so you ask the question, and they're kind of trying to fill you out, and they're thinking in their mind, like, does he know? Does she know? And then finally, you just, if, you're, if you're skilled enough, you ask the right questions, and all of a sudden, they just let it out. And they're not telling you something you don't know, but now that they've told you through relationship, you can respond to that differently, right? And then as they get older and you do that, then, then after the punishment or conversation or whatever happens, they come back and ask you, they go, hey, did you know that? You're like, yeah, I knew that, right? And at a certain point, what you want them to understand is, listen, I know, I'm going to find out. Why do we act like that with God sometimes? Why do we try to hold back sadness, frustration, our, our desire, the things that are bothering us as though if we say them to God, we're going to like bring him into some conversation that he doesn't already know about? As a dad, I want my kids to be honest with me. I think God wants us to be honest as well. We don't have time to read it this morning, but if you, if you go through the ne next next section in verses, what you see is not only did Jesus pray openly and honestly, but he prayed over and over and over again openly and honestly. It says that he, he went and prayed and he came back to the disciples and they were asleep and he, he, he challenged them and kind of corrected them and there was some frustration because they, they couldn't stay awake. And then he goes and he prays again and then he comes back and he, he went back multiple times to pray and it says that he prayed the same thing. Luke says that he prayed with, with earnesty. He prayed in a way that, that reflects what he taught to the disciples in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. In Matthew 7, 7 and 8, it says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be open to you. It's this idea, listen, that we can come to the Father multiple times. We don't have to ask one time that when something's on our mind, when something's burdening us, it's okay to pray, not just a one-time kind of Hail Mary at the end of the game kind of deal, but we can come back to him again and again and again because in honesty, we can share with him whatever's on our heart, whatever's on our mind. We can be honest with God. Because that honesty grows the relationship, and prayer ultimately is about the relationship. It's not just simply a transaction. And so Jesus prayed with openness and honesty. And here's the fourth thing. Is that Jesus' prayer reflected a humble obedience. It reflected a humble obedience. And I think that this part of his prayer is what makes this the greatest prayer ever prayed. I think this is where the power of the prayer really comes into play and the power of what we can learn from this prayer can make the biggest difference in our life. And here, here's what it says. Look at Matt, Mark 14, 36 again. Jesus finished up this prayer with these words. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Look, Jesus prayed to his dad. He prayed with truth and in trusting who God was. He prayed with openness and honesty. He asked what was on his heart. He asked if there was another way, but then he finished his prayer with humility and submission. He said, but yet in all of this, not what I will, but what you will be done. See, Jesus understood that at the end of the day, God's will, even if it was different than what his prayer was, was better. And even if God said, no, I will not let this hour pass from you, no, I will not take away the cup of my judgment that you're going to drink, even in that, Jesus said, but I'm willing to do what you want because you're God. And he said, not my will, but what you will. And see, God's will meant that Jesus would have to do the things that in, the, in, the, in his prayer he didn't want to do. But he was, he was willing to do them because he trusted in the Father. Listen, that, that, that God's will was death first, then resurrection. It was sacrificing Jesus' life on the cross, then we can be forgiven. 
If Jesus hadn't been willing to go to the cross, there would be no resurrection. There would be no forgiveness. There would be no hope in the world for our sin. But Jesus prayed, not what I will, but what you will. Again, in Matthew 6, verse 10, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught to pray this way. Verse 10 says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. Jesus believed this so much that he, he believed it all the way to giving his life on the cross. Because he believed that God's will was better than even what he in that moment was asking. See, Jesus in that moment saw, I think, kind of two, two visions, right? He saw the cross and he saw what was going to await him, but then he also saw that God had the power to, to overcome that and bring victory. So I think sometimes we, have, we, ch- we, we wrestle choosing God's will over ours because we focus only on the difficulty or the adversity that we're going to face in that moment, and we forget about the victory that God says is to come. See, but Jesus thought about both, and he was willing in humble obedience to follow God and his leading in that moment. And I think this, that's really where the, the power of that prayer kind of comes into play. It was that he was willing to say to the Father, listen, this is what I desire, Dad. This is what, 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 what I'm asking. But at the end of the day, what you want is more important than what I want. Your will over my will. You know, it's interesting that the setting of this prayer was a garden. It's one of the things Pastor Brian talks about a lot is that when when Scripture includes location, the location is often significant. Like, where did something happen? If it's going to say it in the Bible, there's probably significance there. And it's interesting, quickly, that, that this prayer happens in a garden. And it was in the garden that Jesus chose God's will over everything else. See, but that's not the only time we see the significance of a decision being made in a garden, right? If you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, we see the creation story. The Bible says that in the beginning there was God. God created the heavens and the earth. So God creates everything, and, and, and he creates Adam and Eve in his own image, and, and he places them where? In a garden, the Garden of Eden. And he says to him, work the garden. Everything you see is yours except for one thing. Don't eat the fruit from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Well, if you know the story, you know what happens. Satan, the enemy, comes and he, he tempts Adam and Eve to not do what God said, but to do what they want to do. And so in, in a moment, they take the apple. Or say, some people say it's an apple. It probably wasn't an apple. They take the fruit, and they eat the fruit that God told them to not eat. In that moment, we see that sin enters into not only their lives, but the world, and the sinfulness of mankind is is something that we've all, it's continued throughout our life. And that sinfulness separates us from a relationship with God that we were created to have. You see, it's as if in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve said, God, not your will, but my will be done. But it was Jesus in the Garden who made a different decision, who did the opposite, who said, no, 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 not my will, but God's will be done. And through that obedience, he reversed the curse of sin and the brokenness and the separation from God that mankind was destined to experience because of the sin in the garden. And he went to the cross to die the death of the penalty of sin so that we Even though we, at some point in our life, every single one of us have have said, and probably multiple times, God, not your will, but what I want, my will be done. And we sin before him. Jesus said, because I said the opposite, because I made a different decision, because I said, God, your will, not my will, 
Because of the cross, we can be forgiven. See, Jesus made a way because he was willing to live for God's will above all. So here's my question this morning as we conclude this and wrap this up. It's several questions as I was thinking about this. Number one is when you face difficulty, you face adversity, when life gets really hard, where do you turn? Where do you turn? See, Jesus, when he faced the most difficult circumstances of his time on earth, he prayed. Not as an afterthought, not as just a routine. He prayed because he believed that prayer was powerful, that prayer had a purpose, and that God in prayer met with him. Where do you turn? Where do we turn when we face difficulty? Do we turn to prayer? And if so, do our prayers reflect the prayers of Jesus in that moment? Do we pray in relationship with God, or do we simply pray as a transaction with God? Do we pray in the knowledge of who God is because we spent time getting to know him, or, and do we trust in, in what we've, we've come to know? So much so that we're willing to see prayer as valuable in our life in those moments. Are we open and honest with God in those moments? We're trying to hold things back thinking that he can't handle it or maybe we don't want to share it with him. And at the end of the day, are we willing to say to God, but whatever's going on, I choose your will and not mine. See, the submission of our will to God in moments of difficulty, I believe, is one of the most challenging things, but it's also one of the most freeing things we can do in walking with God. So this morning, do you have something going on in your life? Are you facing difficulty? Are you facing adversity? Are you facing struggles and trials? And maybe you've prayed about it before. You're getting weary because you're like, God, I don't know what you're doing. God, I don't know how, why this isn't working out. I don't, I don't know the answer, but, but have, have you given up on going to God again and again and again as your father, knowing that he loves you, that he trusts you? Are you open with him? Are you believing in him? And are you willing at the end of the day to say, God, but yet your will, not mine and find freedom and submission? If so, I want to give you a chance, like we all need, just to respond. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this moment today where we can, God, see the truth of your, your word again. We can see, God, in Jesus that, that we have a Savior who knows, he understands, he, he faced, God, trials and difficulties and temptation. God, your word says in Hebrews that, that, that he's, he's able to sympathize with, with, with what we go through on this, this earth. And God, he showed us the example that, that when we face difficulty, we need to turn to prayer. And when we pray, we need to pray like Jesus prayed. We need to pray to our Father. And so if we don't know you as Father, if you've never forgiven our sin, we've never, never made Jesus our Lord and Savior, if we've never confessed our sin to you, God, ask Jesus into our life, then God, today, that's the first thing we need to do. But God, if we followed you, God, maybe today we're wrestling through, we're walking through some difficulty, and we just need to come back to prayer a fresh and a new. And maybe today we need to release our will and God trust you and your will and ask that in that moment you would give us peace. God, whatever we need to do today, we want to be people who are surrendered to you. So God, we give this time to you to work in us as you see fit. It's in Jesus' name, amen.